So continuing on the topic of fuzzing, there's a number of different approaches that you can take with fuzz testing uh, and different approaches that are used by different fuzzing tools. So the simplest form of fuzzing is just to feed in something, for example, of increasing size into a program. So you might expect something that's, you know, so there might be an opportunity for some input. And so it might try A, 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 and basically just get bigger, or I'm going to just get bigger faster and basically see if that breaks it. It might um, try putting in characters that it thinks it might not expect. It might just be random, but it might include special characters that um, certain vulnerabilities are likely to be triggered from. So for example, you might include some you know, the dashes or hash hashes, which might indicate the end of like a SQL query or a comment in a, in a script. You might put some semicolons in, in case there's some bash um, injection possible, maybe some other bash characters like dollar signs and open close brackets. Um, angular brackets, which might be um, might be relevant for like script in injection uh, or like cross site scripting or something like that. Um, <clears throat> so there might be specific kind of like combinations of characters that it will that it will try, like quotes and single quotes. Um, so that's like one approach is just to hammer it with some random stuff. Um, another approach is to take something that it's expecting and kind of go from there. So if it's expecting an input that's uh, a word, you start with a word and start making changes to it. Um, you might actually have uh, a program that reads one input and then reads a second input. So you could try you know, you might try uh, the first input correctly, or if I just try fuzzing the first input, and then you might try fuzzing the second input, you might try a combination of those two things. Um, <clears throat> so you basically start from what the program expects and then make changes from there. And mo the more aware the fuzzer is, or, or the fuzzing script is, of what the expected behavior is, and the closer it is to that, um, then the more likely it's going to be successful because you're going to hit more parts of the code that you're testing. So if you've got some code that has a, a, a nested if statement, for example, if you don't get through, get past that first if statement, then you can't test the things that are, in, you know, um, you know, uh, nested within that. And so um, sometimes it can be helpful if you've got the source code and you're doing fuzz testing because there might be some bugs that are subtle enough that you won't notice them when you're looking at the code. But, um, you, you know, by creating a, a fuzz testing script, you might have more success at actually finding bugs. Um, you can also look at it from a um, protocol perspective. So, you know, you might want to start up, well, either if there are published protocols about something like FTP protocol, for example, you might have fuzzing scripts that are designed to test FTP servers or clients and um, fire those off um, either by being the malicious client or the malicious server um, to test the other one. Um, or you can, you know, if you don't know what the protocol is, you might be able to fire up Wireshark, for example, and watch the communication happening and create a, a fuzz testing script based on Okay, well, this is what it's expecting. What happens if it does something that's different from that? <clears throat> but yeah, there are certain things that, like, if you're testing HTTP, for example, you need to maintain the content length header in order for it to process the body of the um, of the query. And so, if you are more aware of that with the fuzz testing, um, then you know you're more likely to find bugs. If you're testing a um, piece of software and you just send something that's completely absolutely random then you might not learn much about the software because you're not getting at the interesting bits of the source code. A lot of the mistakes are in the most complicated bits of the code and to get to those complicated bits of the code you need to like do kind of what the program is expecting uh, until you get to that complicated bit and then do something different. So there are a number of open source software um, fuzzers that you that you could use. There's Spike, which is a popular framework 
for specifying like fuzzer scripts. So you can write a spike script and um, you, you can use that to do the, the sorts of things that we've been talking about. Um, spike is good, it's popular, it's not very well documented, but um, you know it's been around for a long time. Um, Sully is a network only um, fuzzer, it's kind of similar to Spike. Peach has a lot of advanced features uh, and it can do things like restart, crash targets, so it can sort of automate the, the target end of things as well. Um, it's got active, it's actively under development. Uh, you can fuzz files or um, you know standard input, network inputs. Um, so Peach is actually one of the best options for fuzzing, but it has quite a bit of a steeper learning curve than say Spike, for example. Um, but you know if you're going to do this a lot, it might be worth like learning learning about how to use Peach. Um, you can use um, you can script your own fuzzer. You could literally write in, in whatever programming language you like. You can just you know interact with a with a program and then suddenly start giving it something it's not expecting. But there are um, in the Metasploit framework there's um, auxiliary fuzzer scripts. So there's a bunch of custom fuzzers that are built uh, in there that you can use. So for example, there's an FTP fuzzer in there. So, so Spike is a framework for specifying fuzzers using Spike files. Um, it's quite popular. It's been in use for a long time. Uh, it was written in C. It's, it's particularly suited to command line input and network fuzzing. Um, but unfortunately, it's not well documented. The documentation is pretty terrible, actually. The best way to learn how it works is to look at the, the Spike scripts that are there. And um, it's not really in active development at the moment. But it is fairly straightforward and it can be um, effective at finding shallow bugs. So it's, you know, it's pretty good. It's, um, the learning curve is, is um, not that steep. It's pretty straightforward. Uh, it's got a fairly like C looking uh, specification language. Um, and it looks a little bit like this. So you have a spike file, which is .s pk and um, it's a template for fuzzing and it's made up of commands so you can put s string uh, and then like a string like this and that will just send that string um, and you could put a, a variable a string variable and you can tell it that same thing and then what it does is it takes that and mutates it so it uses that as the default but then it will fuzz that string by putting variations of that and just spewing random stuff in it instead of that value as well you can read lines, so that will um, wait for a response from the other end. So, you know, um, th so this can apply for both local um, software that you're interacting with on standard I.O. or a network, uh, via a network protocol. Um, so either way, it will like, wait for to receive something back from the server or for, you know, the, the program to, to output something. Um, Spike send just like clears the buffer. If you're doing networking stuff, it can be helpful to do that just to force it to like actually send the send the the result. Um, and printf prints to the local console uh, to you know so you can show some kind of local debugging type stuff. So you can then use the spike file to launch it against a network port or a program using one of the Spike's interpreters. So the generic send TCP um, program you can use to basically so you call that program and you pass in the host um, that you're um, trying to connect to, the port, the spike script you want to use, and then you can specify um, whether you want to skip to a specific point in the fuzz testing. So if it crashes at some point or you want to stop it for one, for for whatever reason, you can resume by telling it at what point to resume. Um, so here's an example. So you got generic send TCP, you got the IP address, and then and the port and the um, the spike file followed by starting at zeros, which means to start at the beginning of the fuzzing. So the first number is the fuzzing variable, such as the first string value variable that appears in the script. So the second one would be the, the next one, and the second number in this is the iterations. So of the strings that it's sending, um, you know, how far along that it got. So if you're 
to, to fuzz something that's more complicated, you, the spike script needs to have um, some added complexity to send certain parts of the input as expected, to focus on fuzzing the inputs that are most likely to trigger flaws. So altering input lengths and command options, altering integers to test for boundary conditions and outliers, uh, command injection, um, embedded characters, and, and so on. So the limitations of fuzzing, though, is that it can be shallow, because if there are branches in logic, it can be hard to follow some. So, you know, you might you need to send a specific kind of command before another kind of command and something else. You might have a whole sequence of events that needs to be to, to trigger in order to uh, get to the point of some vulnerable code or to trigger a um, security problem. Um, so, you know, if you if you're just doing shallow fuzz testing, um, basically the fuzz testing you do is only going to be as good as this, the script that you write um, and or that someone else has written if you're using a standard protocol script. Uh, so something like FTP, it might be easier to fuzz because it's a standard protocol and people will have written decent FTP fuzzers in the past. If you're fuzzing something that's completely new, then you need to spend quite a bit of time to analyze what it's expecting so that you can create a fuzz testing script that will deviate from that. Um, so following every branch in logic may be impractical or impossible. Um, you might also, there's also like an exponential problem where like the deeper in you go, the, you know, there's more, so many more branches that you need to follow to get there. Um, there's black box testing um, can involve a substantial amount of reverse engineering to try and fuzz pro um, proprietary protocols and formats. Um, and you can use evolutionary fuzzing, um, which is um, what, um, not what Spike does, but it's, it's a um, more advanced approach where you can um, actually direct code coverage and um, improve coverage by uh, looking at the amount of coverage that you've managed to get. Um, so we're going to come back to the topic of buffer overflows in more detail soon, but one of the things that you're looking for when you're fuzzing software, so the kind of a lot of what we've been talking about is generic enough that you could apply, you know, you can do, you can fuzz web apps and in fact in the web, uh, when we're talking about website stuff, we'll talk about that separately, really. What we're, what this is more about is fuzzing um, binary system files or programs and network services uh, and a, a lot of network services and system services and system software is written in program programming languages like C and C++ which are not memory um, safe, you know, it's not a type safe language. There's a lot of ways to introduce memory um, vulnerabilities. And what that will look like is when you see the program crash, it's a big red flag. So if you manage to create input that crashes the program that you're testing, then that's something that you can look at in more detail. So what you might want to do, or what's usually a good idea, is if you run the target program that you're um, fuzzing in a debugger, then you can watch it crash. Especially if you, you know, you don't have to. You could run it outside of a debugger, and as soon as you see it crash, okay, let's load it up in a debugger so that we can actually see exactly what's happening. And then you can watch the, watch it crash and see the exact state it's in when it crashes. And um, that can give you information about like the register values and um, you know specifics specifically this so a number of like telltale signs that you've got a um, say a buffer overflow for example. Uh, the other thing you can do when you're um, as you're doing your testing is to start Wireshark up. So if you've got Wireshark running, that's helpful so that you can actually see what the fuzz is doing exactly. Um, there are other ways you can pull the information out just based on the variable it gets up to. But the, I find the easiest way is if you start Wireshark, you can see exactly what the fuzz is sending uh, and what the responses are. And you can watch it and look at, okay, when it crashed, okay, what was the last thing it sent? And then you get that string that you can use to test it again. Um, So, you know, this as we've, um, you know, we'll continue to, to discuss, the stack is um, 
basically as a pro as a program's running you've got the the stack which is a uh, um first in first out kind of like stack of um frames like pro function frames that are, that are like the um the, the stack frames of each time while well, the program's running each time a function is called so every time a new piece of code runs it, get, it gets a, a um a, a stack frame placed on top and so you, you know you've got one function that calls another function that calls another one and you know the, the, the registers in the CPU um, basically track where the stack is so it tracks the bottom of the stack that's in this register the EBP the top of the stack is ESP and there's an important register which is EIP which is the instruction of the next the, the address of the next instruction that gets executed and that actually is stored on the stack, and so it gets um, from the stack it gets loaded into EIP based on the way that the um, you know program executes. So um, buffer overflows often aim to overwrite the return pointer so that EIP gets set to something else. So that's a way that it can basically execute. You can control it to make it execute. Um, the, the wrong software. That's basically what stack smashing is. Um, and we'll come back to all that and we'll explain that all in more detail. But that's just to say that when a program seg faults, we get like an access violation, um, that's usually a sign that you've got a buffer overflow because the reason it's crashing is because the EIP ends up pointing at something that is not a valid memory address and not something that it can execute. So if you just feed in random input, there's a good chance that if you manage to override it with an accidental buffer overflow, it will override it not in a clever way that gives you root access to the machine in the first instance. The first thing it will do is just crash the software. So that's something that you're looking for is that the software like seg faults, so you get an access violation and it like the program stops working properly. So um, you know if you're while well, you're fuzz testing, you, you can use the um, the debugger to look at EIP. And if, it, if you get an invalid memory address, um, then that gives you a sign, that's the sign that you've managed to overwrite it. And you know, typically as like a shortcut to that, we try and fuzz with, or we, as we're testing a software, we put in a bunch of up, up, uppercase A's, which will show up as the ASCII, ASCII 41 in hex. So um, you will, uh, basically it will show up um, as, if you if you put in a bunch of A's and you manage to write overwrite e, EIP, it'll show up as EIP trying to actually load uh, the next instruction from this memory address, which is not a valid one, and therefore you get a crash. Um, and so when you see that, that's a big red flag that there's some vulnerable software and you found yourself a buffer overflow. So if we ever see see a crash, and the uh, EIP is something like 41, 41, 41, 41 in hex then you know you know you've got a good chance of influencing um, program control and probably sitting on a potential um, exploit um, or vulnerability that can be exploited so you know if you're using um, Oli debug for example then um, you know you'll see something like this here where you've got this access violation while accessing this memory address uh, obviously there's lots of different debuggers you can use um, but that's the sort of thing you're looking at and if you look here on this um, screenshot, you can see EIP is pointing at this invalid um, address, which is a bunch of A's. So that's a telltale sign that you've managed to um, cause a, a, a buffer overflow on the stack. Um, and it's the first step towards writing a, a valid um, attack um, and or just finding a new zero day vulnerability is if you fuzz a bunch of software. Um, and you manage to see something like this, then that's a good sign that you are part of the way there.